Minh Thúy xin kính chào quý vị hôm nay thứ Sáu, 28 tháng 6, 2024. Đến với VATV hôm nay gồm có phỏng vấn đặc biệt và nhạc lá bồ đề. Kính thưa quý vị, trong khoảng năm 1962 đến năm 1963, những biến chuyển ở Sài Gòn và ở các vùng nông thôn đã khiến cho một số sĩ quan Việt Nam, thí dụ như Đại úy Nguyễn Tùy, cho rằng không nên rút các sư đoàn ở miền Trung đi để Cộng sản có thể dễ dàng tiến vào. Nhưng cùng lúc đó lại có một số sĩ quan Việt Nam khác như tướng Tôn Thất Đính lại cho rằng quân đội Việt Nam đã đủ mạnh và vì thế có phối trí cách nào đi nữa cũng chẳng có ảnh hưởng mạnh gì đến tình hình an ninh. Không chỉ ở phía Việt Nam, cả phía Mỹ cũng không có cái nhìn giống nhau. Cơ quan dân sự United States Operation Mission cho rằng Tình hình miền Trung đang mất dần an ninh, nhưng Bộ Viện trợ Quân sự lại cho rằng miền Trung rất an ninh. Những suy nghĩ khác biệt đó đã khiến cho Phòng Thông tin Hoa Kỳ gửi Frank Scotton về miền Trung để tìm hiểu. Lần này khi về miền Trung, ông Frank Scotton được toàn quyền tự do hành động để thăm dò vùng Long An. Thay vì hành động một mình, đơn thương độc mã như những lần công tác trước, Lần này, ông Frank Scotton quyết định thăm dò bằng cách khác. Ông quyết định tuyển mộ và huấn luyện nhân viên ngay trong các ấp ông thăm dò. Dưới sự chỉ huy của Scotton, ba toán, mỗi toán khoảng 7-8 người sẽ tản ra để thăm dò ba ấp khác nhau. Sau khi thăm dò tình hình ban ngày, ban đêm ba toán sẽ họp lại để cùng nghỉ đêm, mỗi đêm ở một địa điểm khác nhau. Những địa điểm này cũng nằm trong số ba ấp thăm dò. Ông Frank Scotton cho rằng như thế khi tiến vào ấp thì Cộng sản sẽ là người xâm lược từ ngoài tiến vào và phe miền Nam sẽ giữ vai trò chính đáng của những người chống xâm lược. Cuộc thăm dò các ấp Long An là một bước ngoặt quyết định trong cuộc chiến ở nông thôn. Cách hoạt động thích đáng và thành công của các đội thăm dò Long An về sau đã được bổ túc để biến thành các đội hoạt động nhân dân mà CIA đã áp dụng cho gần như toàn thể các hoạt động chống cộng ở vùng nông thôn trong toàn cõi miền Nam Việt Nam. Sau đây Minh Thúy mời quý vị tiếp tục theo dõi phần 5 phỏng vấn đặc biệt về tình hình Việt Nam trong những năm 1962 đến năm 1963 qua các công tác của ông Frank Scotton do Phan Lê Dũng, Võ Thành Nhân và Minh Thúy thực hiện. But the Vietnamese, do you think the Vietnamese sees the problem or do they see the problem and have to do it because there's an order from the uh, central government or do they not see these things just like the American? Uh, I thought that some Vietnamese saw the problem. I thought that Captain Thuy, for example, who commanded that fourth independent company, I thought he definitely saw it. I thought that Tran Van Hai, uh, later police director and then finally 7th Division commander where he committed suicide in 1975, uh, he was the province chief in Phu Yen when I met him and, that, and then uh, temporarily in command of the 47th Regiment. I thought he was very sharp, very perceptive and he saw that. Um, but then others I, I, I didn't think Uh, sorry, it. it was almost if they, as if they thought that uh, whatever the communists did would be irrelevant because uh, now they had independence and they could organize and they were, they were, you know, they were ready to do whatever needed to be, to be done. And I thought some of the, I met Tong Ta Din, for example. I don't want to be disparaging of someone, but I, I. I could hardly believe that he was a general officer when I met him. I, I thought he was... This, and that was at the time you were only 22 something and this yeah, your perception was, by then that he yeah. was very uh, incompetent, yeah. so yeah. say. Yeah. Um, well, let me mention quickly something else. The, you know, one consequence of the... Uh, there were so many consequential items falling out from the the... the the 1963 murder of the president and things like that. And, uh, but uh, one was that um, 
there had been some discussion in, in the White House about whether or not security was deteriorating in any part of the country. And uh, uh, Rufus Phillips uh, had a report from the USOM representative in Long An province indicating that there was uh, real deterioration there, fairly close to Saigon. So in December of 63, before I was allowed to go back to central Vietnam, um, I, I was brought down uh, to Saigon. And uh, uh, F. Bumgardner had obtained uh, you know, some uh, pistols from the CIA station that could be used in a concealed fashion. And he said, uh, I don't know exactly how you want to do it, but um, I want you to do a quick survey in a, this area of Long An, from Tanan, province capital, to the Mita border, province border area, or Din Tung it was called at that time, um, an area of uh, 30 or 40 hamlets. Uh, uh, you know, Mac, Mac V says it's secure, uh, Yusam says it's not. You know, can you get in there and find out what's happening? So I said, yeah, sure. So that is a precursor to what uh, my brother Frank Snip mentioned as, as work with small teams. For the first time then, I was given responsibility to go into an area, find out what would happen, and do it any way I wanted to. So I organized uh, three teams and uh, equipped them and everything and said, okay, we'll go in here talk with someone from every family in a hamlet. And we'll work in three adjoining hamlets at the same time. And at nighttime, we'll regroup into one of those three hamlets, you know, so that we'll have uh, maybe 20, 24 people for nighttime defense. In the daytime, you'll be back out with six or eight people in the team. And here are the basic questions I want you to ask to find out I, I want you to develop a history. What has happened in that hamlet? What do the people think is the most important thing in their lives? Um, well, uh, what we did find uh, over a roughly three-week period is that uh, Rufus Phillips and Yusam representative had been correct. There was tremendous deterioration in that area. Um, the, the communists led by a woman fighter were ascendant um, the, uh, the front barbed wire sections of all the so-called strategic hamlets had been retained, but the side and rear portions of the defensive works were all gone. There was uh, one uh, local force, triangular-shaped, mud-walled uh, fort representing the, the government, flying the government flag, uh, but they never went outside of their little triangular area. <laughs> they were isolated. Uh, and by the way, about a month after I left, they, they were overrun. So, so that, that, that report went up, went up into uh, uh, the embassy and, and had some fallout effect. But, what it, but it was also educative for me because uh, I learned from that that you know we can we can organize at least on a local tactical level we can organize as well as the communists. I I wouldn't say better, but we can we can do it just as well. Um, and at that point of the war, we we can have better equipment. Um, and 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 it's possible to make a difference. So going up, uh, uh, about uh, a month or so later, then being released, you might say, to return back up to central Vietnam and seeing this fellow Major Kelly that I had uh, mentioned previously, Kelly told me that a, a former Viet Minh uh, named uh, Nguyen Zui Bé, uh, I've mentioned his name because he's deceased now, uh, had approached the uh, district chief in Tungia and asked, asked, you know, feared the return of the communists. 
and his punishment, and he had asked for some help in organizing a, a self-defense unit. So Kelly brought me down to the hamlet where this fellow met. He, he, diminutive, uh, but vibrant with personality. And, uh, and I wanted to meet him because I didn't want to just sign off on, okay, I'm going to go to friends and special forces and, and the CIA station and ask for weapons and you know, a supplement uh, for meals during training and things. And, and then I find out the guy's a bum. But he was very impressive. And uh, so that was the start of a local self-defense force that, according to the concept that we worked up together, uh, Winsby Bear, Major Kelly, and myself would be mobile at that point within a district area, never going beyond that district, but mobile within that district working, uh, as I had done in Long Island Province, working during the daytime, maybe in three different adjoining hamlets. Uh, and I say working by helping people, or just being friendly, uh, you know, uh, visiting the schools, uh, passing out things, doing anything at all, but being an active presence. And at nighttime, being in one hamlet, grouped together, not in a fort, not in an outpost, in the hamlet. So if the communists had to come in, they were the ones that would have to enter a hostile hamlet. See? And that was the beginning of what eventually with some, a lot of bureaucratic adjustments. When uh, you're talking to the villagers, are they more um, so-called political aware of the situation? Are they actively choosing side, uh, communists or nationalists or do they don't know anything and well there were in, in any location you could find that there were some there were some people who are in I think significant part because of family connections there were some people who were um, supporters of the uh, communist communist uh, there were others also for personal reasons family members who were perhaps been killed by the communists, or frustration at communist requests for assistance in terms of foodstuffs and things like that, mm -hmm. that were not at all supportive of the communists. But in any case, uh, absent meaningful government presence in the hamlets, they had to be responsive. Mời quý vị đón xem phần 6 phỏng vấn ông Frank Scotton, nhân viên cao cấp của Sở Ngoại vụ Hoa Kỳ, sẽ được phát hình vào tối thứ Sáu ngày 5 tháng 7, 2024.